the next narcissist will be better. I learned my lesson. I know now to identify the warning signs and the red flags. I will avoid this. I will modify this. I will not provoke him. He will not provoke me. I will control him. I will modify him. I will manipulate him. I will be the self-deception, of course. Self-deception. And you end up with the narcissist again. And again. And again. It's not uncommon to find victims of narcissists with eight partners, ten partners. Not uncommon at all. All of them, without exception, psychopaths and narcissists. Not uncommon. It's an addiction. My can't call. Can you not even hear about all of this? Like with the narcissist, you need to hit rock bottom. You need to you need to have your life finished. You need to really be under the carpet for any meaningful transformation to happen. But for example, if your career is good, you, you're not at rock bottom and you will continue to date narcissists. You need everything in your life simultaneously to, to collapse, die, disappear. You need post-apocalyptic nuclear war for you to be able to transform yourself. If there's any area or part of your life that is still functioning, still successful, still okay, you will derive energy from that part and you will put it into the relationship. You need to be in a state where you have no source of energy. You have no access to energy. Well, then maybe. But if you are very successful at your career, you're making a lot of money, it gives you energy. You take this energy, you put it in analysis. And the narcissist, of course, <laughs> sucks it up. Can it develop again? I mean, if, for example, if you hit rock bottom and you kind of put yourself together piece by piece and then you seek for a non-narcissistic relationship, can it occur again in your life that for some I reason you, I don't know. There's you not, start not to be attracted again? We don't know. There's not enough experience. Okay. The victims of abuse is a syndrome. I mean, I suggested it as a syndrome in 95. 95 is nothing. 95 is 24 years. We don't have enough track record. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's happening to victims. And we need 50 years, 100 years. You know. Thank you. Why is it so strong, the BDSM, <coughs> between the narcissistic and the victim? The BDSM. And fetishes. And fetishes. Sexual fetishes. Sexual fetishes. Why is it so common between them? You, uh, does Barbara mean what I have just described, or does she mean sexual practices? In her practice, she usually meets a lot of clients when BDSM and fetishism is a thing that kind of keep these couples together as a glue. What does it have to do with the whole story? What, what is behind? Well, I think we should make a distinction between BDSM, which is a consensual activity with very strict codes of starting and ending, what is allowed, what is not allowed, you know, red, red flag, I mean, red, uh, key, uh, red words, keywords, and, and also there is aftercare. Like after the sexual session of BDSM, you take care of your partner. You, you hurt your partner at, at his request or her request and you need to show her that you hurt her because you love her, not because you... So BDSM is a highly structured, highly ritualistic activity which involves code words, coded communication, non-coded communication, uh, before and after phases and so on. I'm not sure if Barbara is talking about this because this is a non-narcissistic uh, practice. Actually, if you're a narcissist in BDSM, it will not work. It will be a mess, and you'll be blacklisted, and no one will, will come close to you. Um, in, in BDSM, you need to be highly non-narcissistic, because you need to listen to your partner. Your partner has the control, the sub, the, sub, the submissive party has control, can communicate her wishes, when to stop, when to start, what she... So, it's a lot of cooperation, a lot of communication. These are not narcissistic traits. 
I think what Barbara means is simply sad, sadism. Mm -hmm. Sadism, masochism, fetishism. Not as structured ritualistic sexual preferences and practices, but as simply torturing each other or causing pain. Now, this has to do with two things. First of all, uh, the narcissist needs, well, if it's a man, it's a male, but increasingly also among females, the narcissist needs to humiliate his uh, sexual partner. He needs to control her via ob extreme objectification. So, you, uh, humiliation means that you objectify the partner to, to totality. And so there's a lot of sadism going on as an expression of women hatred, misogynism. And all narcissists are misogynists. And increasingly all female narcissists are androgynists. Mm -hmm. uh, they hate uh, uh, misandrists, I'm sorry. They hate uh, men. So there's hatred of the other sex. Mm -hmm. Or hatred of same sex, it doesn't matter, but like hatred of the sexual preference. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a need to humiliate and objectify. That's the first thing. The second thing, usually the other party believes that she can exert some control by satisfying her, her partner. So she, she tries to regain power or retake some of the power, small amount of the power, by providing sexual services to her partner so that he becomes dependent on her in some way. Mm -hmm. So there's an attempt to create dependence via total submissiveness. And so there's a sadistic element and there is an element of submissiveness, but submissiveness intended to create control, actually. So, like, where will you find someone like me who will do anything that you want? Kind of. Yeah. So, this is the first uh, complex of, of behaviors. More profoundly, sadomasochism and especially fetishism. Fetishism in the sense of objects or body parts, which are mm -hmm. uh, the targets of sexual uh, energy. Uh, more profoundly, it's a language. Uh, the narcissist uses sex and sexual preferences to communicate. So very frequently, narcissists would use sex to tell the partner, I'm not happy with you. So there would be brutal, painful, or humiliating sex. Or the narcissist would, would uh, uh, tell the partner, communicate to the partner via sexual practices, uh, you are for me a collection of parts. You are not a real, full-fledged, integrated human being. But you are like in the butcher. You are a collection of parts. I will now focus on your feet. That's it. Not paying attention to any other part of you. Focusing on your feet. It's a, it's a tactic to inform the partner that she is not a human being. She is not integrated. She doesn't exist in a totality. But she is slices of meat. So it's also a very frightening Arrowing message. That's all. So sex is used to communicate these messages of I'm in control, I have the power, I can do anything to you, I'll objectify you, I'll humiliate you, I will show my hatred of, for example, your sex, your gender, hatred of women, through you, and so on. More generally now, narcissists have severe problems with sexual identity and sexual sex differentiation. At a very early stage of life, their sexual differentiation and, and sexual identity had, have been disrupted. So, for example, many narcissists had a very domineering mother, very overweening mother, a mother who refused to let them go, refused to let them separate, used them as an extension or instrument triangulated with them against the father, etc., etc., etc. This disrupts the proper development of sex differentiation and sexual identity. Because as far as sex differentiation, if you are an extension of a woman, you cannot be a man, by definition. Think about it. If you are an extension of a woman, you cannot be a man. Mm -hmm. It disrupts the development of masculinity in men. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when it comes to sexual identity, 
if she, for example,